Hey folks, the lesson here revolves around this term world and its relationship to phenomenology. I'm just gonna give some background about how to understand this term and um, think about some of the ways we're already using it. So first, when people are using the word world, they are not referring to the thing that pops up when I search world in Google Images, um, which is say a synonym for earth. Um, that is not what we mean by world. Um, that is not say the only ordinary language usage of the word world. Um, I always think of a whole new world from Aladdin and actually this gives me a better picture of what um, a world is, even though it's trivial, just the idea. Um, a whole new fantastic point of view, a whole new world, and they're soaring above the clouds into something different. Um, this gets at something a little closer to what I think folks are getting at. And also the notion um, of Disney makes me think of Disneyland and amusement parks as worlds. Um, those who are fans of amusement parks um, might be sympathetic to this idea um, that part of the joy of uh, these kinds of environments is a sense of immersion, of entering into a space and sometimes a time that feels as if it is a different world or that it is, it is something that surrounds you or envelops you. So when we talk about world in this fashion, um, what do we mean? What is a world and what is a cinematic world? Um, and a kind of tweaked version of these questions that I want to ask um, is, can certain things or movies be more worldish than others? Um, unfortunately, in English, we don't have a word that would stand in the place of worldish, making the noun world into an adjective. In German, though, um, you have it. Um, you can kind of put ish onto any word. Um, and I think the word is something like Weltlichkeit. Uh, that is kind of, I think, a useful way of talking about um, world and, and film. Let's just look at this opening line from Cinebrink, and I'm just gonna isolate one part of it that I think is important. Um, he says, I offer in this essay some critical reflections on the significance of mood, suggesting that mood works in narrative film by the disclosure of cinematic worlds. A cinematic world is much more than a vague metaphor suggesting an imaginative construction. It has a visual complexity and symbolic consistency that justifies its designation as a world. First thing I wanna draw your attention to is this notion of disclosure. Um, if you, I didn't do this, but if you count how many times Cinebrink uses the word disclosure, you'll realize that there's something about this term that matters a lot to him. Um, but it's enough for us just to think that it's attached to this idea of world. A world is something that is disclosed, um, or in other words, revealed. Um, that is actually not a trivial thing. We'll talk about what, why that matters. Um, other two terms that matter is complexity. Um, worlds don't have to be complex, but they often are. Um, and uh, consistency. Um, why are those things important? Um, Cinebrink doesn't do the philosophical work of explaining. Um, that these are actually definitional aspects of what a world is um, in philosophy and in particular phenomenology. Um, but I wanted to bring in what I've always thought was a really useful definition of world um, by um, a film scholar named Ryan Pearson who writes about worlds in an article about animation and camera movement. Um, just check out some aspects um, of this quote. And I wanna start with just a piece of it and work through it. Um, so Pearson says, uh, Pearson in the article has gone over a number of definitions um, of world and philosophy and he summarizes them saying these accounts all define world in the same basic way as a field of related possible actions. There are two criteria at work here. First, as a field, the world must exceed our view of it. It must continue beyond our horizon. Some part of it must remain hidden from us. Okay, that's actually super smart and useful. Um, if a, if a world is to be a world, um, either say my experience of sitting here uh, in, in, in a kitchen as being part of a world, or say my experience of watching a movie or playing a video game, the idea is I have to feel as if um, the world is larger than what I can perceptually access, that it exceeds my view of it. Um, that is incredibly useful. Um, the second, a world must work as a structural invariance that defines what kinds of actions may take place within it. It's a bit jargony. Um, I think we can just summarize it by saying worlds generally have rules or consistent kinds of behaviors or conventional things that happen in them. Um, 
that's why I say a cartoon world is sometimes different or, or often different from our own world because of what physics can allow. But you'll notice if you like Warner Brothers cartoons that there's a lot of, uh, say, physical consistencies that make it feel like Roadrunner and, uh, and Coyote are in a world of their own, that it operates according to a certain number of principles. Also, those of you who play video games will notice that video games always have a concrete set of rules that you make, that once you learn them, you feel like you're operating within that world. Pearson will say, in sum, we can just say, um, considering these two criteria, a world surrounds us and supports us. That is, there's a perceptual aspect. I feel as if the world is all around me, um, and also that it supports me. It's the thing that allows me to exist. Let's get a little more concrete and see how can we see these things applied to art. Um, phenomenologists are not often talking about art. They're just talking about background conditions for what it means to be a perceptual subject uh, in, this, in this world or, or, or here. Um, but you can apply this to art, and that's what we're doing in this class. We're talking about films. But I actually think you can get a better understanding of worldishness and world um, by actually looking at video games um, before looking at films. I think video games are some of the most worldish uh, kinds of um, visual media that exist. Um, and it's not just nominally because we often refer to video games as worlds and advertisers refer to video games as worlds all the time, especially um, when video games were in their heyday in the 1980s and 1990s. Think about the mottos um, of video game creators. We create worlds, live in your world, play in ours. Um, video game companies invoking the notion of world. David Sudnow, uh, who is a phenomenologist, wrote a book on 70s video games called Pilgrim the Micro World. Um, but it's not enough to just notice that we use the word, word world all the time when we're talking about video games. What makes the medium so worldish? Well, I think we can go back to Pearson's um, definition and pick out two criteria and think about video games when we're talking about them. Um, we might think that there's a condition of being situated within a field of potential action. Um, that's what Pearson himself says at the beginning of his definition. Then you can break it down into two aspects. One has to do with space. This is a feeling of the game's space exceeding our view of it, right? We'll, we'll see how that plays out in a moment, but it should be intuitive to anyone who's played a video game that there is a space. And right now when you're having a screen and you're operating your avatar, um, you know that you can explore more space than what is available on that screen by moving your avatar. Um, and action, speaking of moving your avatar, is the capacity for acting, moving, and choosing within the game and the rules and possibilities of doing so. Um, this is what makes video games games and not movies, um, right? That you can act the way that you can act in a world. Um, but we can immediately start to say that some games are more worldish than others. Um, I think we have an intuition to say that three-dimensional games are games that operate according to um, uh, three dimensions, um, like left, right, up, down, um, 360 degree views of things are more worldish. Um, but why? Um, right? Um, in both games, I have the freedom to move. Um, in one game on the right, I seem to have more freedom, and that freedom seems to resemble the way in which um, I have a freedom to move in my ordinary world. Um, I have to suspend some disbelief when I'm playing um, old school Super Mario um, to not imagine that little side-scrolling Mar Mario can say turn 90 degrees to his left and go into the depth of the screen or come z-axis out toward me. I just have to suspend my disbelief that he can't do that. It's not part of the rules of his world to have those dimensions, right? Um, maybe that's why Super Mario 64 is a little more worldish. And we also will say that, say, as we get better graphics and things resemble our own world, like in um, Red Dead Redemption or something like this, things become more worldish. But I don't want to make this only a matter of graphics, um, uh, because worldish is not about resemblance to our world. There's, it's, it's more so uh, attached to those criteria. So you might say, which is more worldish between these two um, video games? Certainly the one on the right is more perceptually realistic. Um, it's a recent video game. Um, things look closer to how they look in the real world. I have depth perspective. Um, in fact, quite a bit of depth. On the left, I have no depth at all. Everything is flat. But I might say that the game on the left is still more worldish insofar as the mode of gameplay in a fighting game on the right actually dissuades you from the things that are constitutive of worldishness, like exploration, or say, going into a space in the distance, right? Um, 
you would not understand the genre of a fighting game if you say looked at that deep space on the right um, or in the in the fighting game on the right and wanted to explore it right um, that's the kind of super mario world um, kind of thing but you can't do that um, it's not so much a world to explore as a stage um, in which to fight um, you can't do worldish things in a fighting game um, and you might say just think about video game history there was a great leap of worldishness um, in uh, 1980 when we went from pong which is more or less like a fighting game um, with a stage and a, and a very limited set of actions that you can take move your paddle up or down um, and uh, knock the ball left and right versus battle zone which was a game with primitive graphics right nothing really resembles things in the world but you started to get 360 degrees and you started to have this fantasy that you could maybe traverse those mountains and of course you couldn't traverse the mountains but actually video game enthusiasts would write about battle zone and be really fascinated by the idea of traversing the mountains in the distance, right? If you see something in the distance and you have a desire to cross it, that is a feel, feeling of worldishness. Um, anyone who likes video games uh, knows that uh, the Zelda game, Breath of the Wild, is known for, uh, for this feeling, right? If you can see it in the distance, you can go to it. Um, and that is worldishness um, to a T. So how do we talk about worldishness in cinema? It's video games are so worldy because they allow us to act and they allow us um, uh, to feel as if we are inside something and feel as if our view of the world is limited, but yet it exceeds our view of it. What about movies in which we can't act at all? We just have partial views of something. Some conventional ways we might think about worlds um, is in terms of space. So space and worldishness are very closely tied together. Often we'll talk about uh, worldishness in these franchise fantasy films like Lord of the Rings series, right? Something about that seems worldish. There's a lot of detail to, um, to the rules and conventions and characters, um, but also just the way in which space is depicted, right? You see this structure um, in the distance and you feel as if you're going to traverse it. Um, this is kind of how Middle Earth works in Lord of the Rings, but a less worldish movie might be something like Room, where the whole film takes place in one space. Um, the drama is confined to a space, and you're going to do probably less imagination of what exceeds the boundaries of your vision. Um, however, right, take an example of a movie that follows the um, restrictiveness of Room. I'm thinking of 10 Cloverfield Lane. But I want to say, and this is just based on my cursory memory of these two films, I want to say that a movie like 10 Cloverfield Lane, um, which I highly re recommend, um, uh, does have a worldishness to it because although we are restricted to one space, um, a lot of the movie's drama and imagination pivots on making us imagine what is going on out there. Um, and it plays with this throughout, right? Remember, worldishness is not just seeing a lot of stuff, it's imagining uh, or intuiting the existence of stuff that lies beyond my perceptual field, right? So maybe Room is about the drama between the two characters, the mother and the child, but 10 Cold Cloverfield Lane um, might get its sci-fi qualifications from the way it engages your imagination for what lies outside of this kind of bunker. Also great movies for quarantine. You might think of world in terms of the Marvel Cinematic Universe. We of course use the word universe, not world, but that's basically what the Marvel Cinematic Universe is. It's a world. Why? Because all of these films are different narratives and yet we in our minds create the consistent world in which all of those narratives occupy. Part of that is done through um, narrative consistency through character continuity, through the integration of narratives. It's almost more like a television series in which the same world is given different stories um, over 20 some odd um, uh, individual episodes. Um, but we can talk about other ways in which movies might be worldish on different scales, right? Um, I like to think about camera movements as a kind of formal uh, way of talking about what, what can be worldish. Um, you can go back to say the earliest movies that existed. Phantom Rides on the left, where you put a camera on the front of a train, and that was a really popular genre, one of the first genres, in fact. Um, or you can look at one of the first films ever made in which they put a camera on a gondola in Venice. 
Um, both are films without narratives. Both are films that are very, very old. There are no characters. They are not fiction. They are documentary. And yet, there, I think there is a perceptual um, way of talking about them that makes one more worldish than the other. Um, now, I've asked different classes about this question, and um, people have, will have um, strong opinions both ways about which is more worldish. Sometimes I ask the question, which is more immersive? Um, I do think that the left is more worldish or immersive. And I think those are distinct terms, but they have some overlap in the question I'm asking here. Um, partly because when I move forward through space with a forward moving camera movement, um, I have a more a sense of occupying a world that surrounds me. My attention goes to the middle of the screen. I can see the thing that I'm moving toward. I anticipate it coming toward me. It's a lot like what it means to feel like you're in a world when you're moving forward through space, right? On the right, though, I don't feel as if I'm moving through the space on my own. I feel as if I'm carried through it. I can't quite anticipate the space that's, that's coming through. Um, it's all a surprise. Um, and anticipation is closer to worldishness than surprise is. Um, if that's not intuitive to you, um, then I'll have to do more work. But that's the kind of closest way I can talk about these two formal, purely formal things as having some uh, more worldishness than others. Um, but the important takeaway here um, for talking about worldishness and why, and why um, talking about worlds and film studies is interesting at all is that worldishness is distinct from narrative. Um, a lot of the ways in which people make claims to say new concepts in film theory is to say narrative and character has dominated the way we've talked about movies. What about things like affect or mood um, or space or time? Um, um, here we can talk about worldishness as one of those things and it is indeed distinct from narrative. And Cinderbrink says the same thing. He says before focusing on character action and narrative development, we should be attentive to how the particular film world is aesthetically revealed and how we are affectively attuned to that world, since that is what makes it possible for us to be res responsibly engaged with what is represented within that world. Um, so he doesn't so much make an overt distinction um, as just assume that they're distinct. Um, and indeed, right, um, the way we've been talking about this, we haven't been talking about stories at all. Narratives can create worldishness, um, but they are not synonymous. They are distinct, right? To feel as if you are surrounded by a world and supported by a world, like when you go to Disneyland um, or when you play a video game, you do not need a narrative at all. Um, I always forget what the story is when I'm playing Super Mario, but I do feel as if I'm occupying and exploring a world. Um, no story is necessary. Um, so how do we um, ask this question on a more fun fundamental level, right? If, according to Pearson, the most central thing about worlds is that they surround us and support us, um, we can maybe say that a cinematic world is also something that surrounds us and supports us. Um, so the last thing we might ask is, is Mulholland Drive worldish? Um, now, this is not the question that Cinderbrink asks, nor is it the question that Elena Del Rio asks. They're talking about affect and they're talking about mood. Um, but I at least wanted to ask this question, and I bet if we had time, we could actually look at all of the films we've watched in this class and put them on a scale of worldishness, which one feels um, more like an immersive world um, that envelops you and which feels less like it. And some films have worlds within worlds. Think about Holy Motors, right? Um, there is a way in which when you're in the car with, um, uh, with Oscar, when he plays a father, you're imagining an entire, an entire world, a cast of characters, right? Is there a mother in this, in this home, right? Um, uh, what, is going, what is their home life look like um, such that we would get this snippet um, of the relationship between the father and the daughter? And then when Oscar stops, that he's, when he stops that car and he goes into the limo, that world is over. And then we think about the broader world, which is, is everyone an actor in the Holy Motors universe, right? That makes our mind go crazy because even though we're limiting our view of um, this film, this film's world to the limo and individual jobs or um, uh, appointments that Oscar has, it does, I think, cause us, if you're watching the movie right, or if you're paying attention, to think about this as, encompassing everybody, right? And that's the beauty of worlds, giving you a snippet of it in order to cause your imagination 
to fill in a whole cinematic world, right? Um, our view of it is always um, confined and it exceeds our view of it, right? So is Mulholland Drive worldish? Well, it does a few formal things that I think um, I might say are worldish or um, uh, make us think about entering and exiting worlds. David Lynch has a habit of um, camera movements that go into um, spaces. Interestingly, when the camera um, at the pivotal moment in Mulholland Drive, when we go from, say, um, the fantasy to the reality, putting it crudely, the camera moves into this blue box. Now, it doesn't literally move into the blue box, um, but I think Lynch wants to create the gesture of, say, entering a new world, a new world with new rules, um, a new world with it's almost a different dimension, right? That's what a world is, right? It has, has its own characters, it has its own rules. Um, it's related to the world we've just seen, but it's like entering a space, right? That's the visual metaphor that goes on here. Same thing with the, um, the, the gif below the, the box gif, right? The film begins right after that um, prologue of the dancing by a camera hazily and ghost, in a ghostly manner settling upon a pillow, right? Not so much entering a space, but it's important that he wants to set the, the tone of the movie by moving forward into a kind of dreamlike structure, right? We are moving forward, but we're also dissolving out. My sense is Lynch likes these visual motifs of entering and exiting worlds because of this manner of, say, um, something transforming. Another kind of worldish trope um, cinematographically in the film are these tons of moving POV shots. Um, sometimes they are preceded by an eyeline match that makes us know that we are looking at the POV, the moving POV of a character, but sometimes, as some of you noted, we won't know what it is and uh, we'll have to intuit what it is. So you, when you get a moving POV shot that's kind of shaky and you don't know who it belongs to, you might think you're in a horror film, but you might think it so quickly um, that, uh, that you might not say, catch yourself actively thinking about it. Um, so that is a kind of immersive worldish thing because it makes you feel like we're enveloped in the world, like we're occupying the point of view of a character. Let's, let me end uh, this mini lesson by simply saying, um, how is the worldishness of Mulholland Drive related to mood, right? That was the whole object of Cinebrink in his article. Um, and let me go back to that early quote and block out what we've already looked at and uh, highlight uh, the part that we didn't look at, especially this um, yellow highlighted sentence at the very end, kind of his thesis of the whole article. He says, my contention is that moods always reveal or express a cinematic world and that distinctive cinematic worlds have their own specific kinds of mood. What does mood have to do with worldishness? And he's largely getting his ideas from Martin Heidegger, though he doesn't cite him. Um, he certainly knows the work of Heidegger. He's kind of cited him elsewhere. So I'm going to just do the work of um, maybe bolstering his own account of why cinematic world and mood would um, be tied together conceptually. So according to Heidegger's analysis, I am always in some mood or another. Um, thus say I'm depressed, such that the world opens up, is, di is disclosed to me as a somber and gloomy place. I might be able to shift myself out of that mood, but only to enter a different one, say euphoria or lethargy, a mood that will open up the world to me in a different way. For Heidegger, moods and disposedness um, are aspects of what it means to be in a world at all, not subjective additions to that inness. Thus, we talk of being in a mood rather than a mood being in us. I think that's actually a really great um, example of some ordinary language um, analysis, right? Why do we say that um, we are in a mood, um, whereas like as if, as, as if a mood is a space that we occupy, that it surrounds us the way a world surrounds us? And we don't talk about, say, emotions that way. Um, we say I'm feeling sad, um, but I'm in a particular dark and somber mood. Um, this is as good as any reason to think about mood and feeling as distinct entities because we talk about them differently and we use prepositions differently to refer to them. I think this is a good way of establishing that mood and world have something to do with one another. 
Um, so what constitutes the mood of Mulholland Drive? There's maybe two answers to this. One, Mulholland Drive, like a lot of Lynch films, does have a generally consistent mood or feeling that we often will call Lynchian or dreamy. But that's actually not what Cinebreak is trying to argue. He's not trying to uh, make an articulation of what the primary mood of Mulholland Drive is. He's actually making a claim about the film's ability to employ sequences that seem autonomous as mood pieces um, that are in some way different or distinct from the narrative consistency of this film, Mulholland Drive. Um, he's interested in moods, not mood. That's what he thinks is one of the hallmarks of, of the film, that there can be sequences that have a mood autonomy. And he'll say, um, as he introduces the film, filmmakers can also explore the possibility of autonomous or enveloping moods. These are sequences that are no longer subordinated to setting up a fictional world or sustaining emotionally relevant moods. We may find such sequences in the films of Lynch, where mood envelops and transfigures narrative meaning, narrative abstractions tell a story, and cinematic stimmung overrides conventional plot. In Mulholland Drive, mood cueing is no longer a background feature guiding our engagement with characters, but a quasi-independent element within the cin cinematic world. The uh, notion of quasi-independent element um, within the cinematic world is crucial. Um, and of course, my favorite sequence and a lot of your, uh, your favorite sequence is one that a lot of people wanted to talk about. And a couple reasons this feels autonomous and it feels driven by mood rather than narrative it takes place 10 minutes within the film. It introduces characters we've never seen before and they are not, say, um, introduced to relate to the characters we've already been introduced to. Right? So it has a sense of autonomy as if it's dropped in the film as a mini short film, um, as it's its own autonomous sequence. But also there are these aspects of it that make it feel off or particularly dreamlike um, um, that make mood or the establishing of a feeling um, something that say makes, that is um, primary over uh, narrative cohesion. So the way it's shot, um, there's a conversation, but the camera floats in an unmotivated manner. It's doing more than it needs to do to record the conversation between these two men. Um, and the floatiness makes us feel unsettled, partly because it maybe makes us feel as if there's a third entity viewing this thing, um, or maybe simply because it makes us feel queasy, or maybe simply because it signifies some kind of wrongness or difference from Hollywood cinematic convention. That's enough to make us feel as if we are paying attention in a new way. Um, I also think the affectively dissonant performance of the uh, of the main um, protagonist of this short film makes us feel as if this is um, um, a mood piece or something feels off. The way he kind of um, puts on a smile, a forced smile, um, even as he's talking about this terrible, terrible recurring nightmare. That makes us feel unsettled. There's also a kind of more conventionally worldish thing that happens when he and his therapist or um, interlocutor go outside, which is we get these conventional to the film um, immersive POV moving shots um, that make us feel as if we're occupying the position of this particular person. And then of course there are supernatural um, and dreamlike elements, right? A, uh, the fact that he has a dream of this kind of terrible entity and he finds out that the, that the entity is there, but also my favorite detail about this, um, the way the entity moves, sliding as if on a dolly or rather as if a kind of ghostly presence, um, kind of clinches the idea that this is this almost autonomous, dreamlike, not quite real um, situation, right? All of these tiny micro differences from the way we expect a world, a familiar world to operate, are doing this thing of creating a, uh, a mood, um, which is a way in which a film um, discloses its world to you, right? If we are always in a, in a mood, then a film is always um, giving off a mood as the way in which it discloses little bits of itself to you, the audience, right? And Lynch's films, are just all about foregrounding that way of disclosing a cinematic world. Um, 
it's not just in the background. Um, it's not an afterthought. It's almost primary. And that's one of the main arguments of Cinebrink. And I think it's, um, I think it's a useful one.